We'll be trying tonight to pick apart the intersection of food, culture and identity, but before we begin, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Larissa Dubetsky, a food writer, professional eater. <laughs> um, I'd like to respectfully acknowledge that we're gathered on the traditional land of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and the elders from other communities who may be here today. So it has been a very long time since food was simply fuel. Food tells a story of where we've come from and where we've been. It also tells a story of who we'd like to be. Food talks back. It says something about us, the people toiling in the kitchens, as well as the people flocking to the restaurants each night. So why do we crave what we crave? And is food the route to peace, love and understanding or simply to high cholesterol? <laughs> Tackling these questions and more tonight, let me introduce our panel. George Kalambaris describes himself as an Aussie chef with a Hellenic heart. The product of a Greek Cypriot mother and Egyptian father, he is behind such restaurant names as The Press Club, Hellenic Republic and Jimmy Grants, as well as being that guy from MasterChef. <laughs> He's also the author of several books, the latest of which, simply called Greek, was released last week. In the middle, we have the Empress of Chinatown. Elizabeth Chong is an author, teacher, cook, curator, media all-rounder and walking culinary encyclopedia about all things Chinese. Born in a small rice farming village in Guangzhou and arriving in Australia aged three, she opened her first cooking school in 1961, teaching Chinese recipes to a largely Anglo-Australian audience. And at the end, we have the lovely Rosa Mitchell, definitely Melbourne's most petite chef. <laughs> um, when Rosa ran Journal Canteen on Flinders Lane, her many regulars simply knew it as Rosa's Kitchen. Born in Sicily and transplanted to Australia at an early age, her philosophy is simple, run a restaurant as if you're at her home for a Sicilian meal. A founding member of Slow Food Victoria, Rosa is a very hands-on chef at her two city restaurants, Rosa's Kitchen and Rosa's Canteen. And with her husband, also has a farm near Yandoit that supplies the restaurants. She's also authored two books, My Cousin Rosa and Rosa's Farm. So, thank you. Um, Let's start. It's a big subject. We only have 45 minutes before throwing to questions, so let's get cracking. And let's get Marcel Proust out of the way. He swooned over Medellin's. Elizabeth Chong, what floats your culinary boat? Oh, I, I guess it's my, my past is my future sort of thing, Larissa. I think that my earliest memories are always associated with food. It was probably my grandmother first, a little tiny diminutive figure in black silk trousers, sitting around the kitchen table with her four daughters-in-law, my mother, one of them, making dumplings for grandma's birthday. And I think that's so long ago, and it's a funny thing, I see my daughter here now and she's doing dumpling workshops now, so four generations later we're still doing the same thing. And then I think my mother, I, I associate my mother with lots of wonderful memories, but mostly it's the food. She brought the food of the China she knew as a young girl to Melbourne. And she didn't speak English, and she ever. All the time she was in Australia, which was something like the age of about 18, she came out and she died at the age of 90, and she just kept speaking Chinese. And, and her cooking was very, very village, village sort of uh, rustic Chinese cooking, but it was beautiful cooking, and I inherited that from her, I think. And then my father was a more flamboyant cook, and he had he was in the food business and business, and there were always chefs around our house and great banquets that lasted two or three days, and you know they were things that I'll never forget. So I suppose I was breathing in the life of of the Cantonese culinary tradition without even knowing it, you know, and it shaped me for what I am now. Do you think it's natural to pick up that sort of thing by osmosis? You just soak it in with your DNA? Oh, I think it's DNA for a start, isn't it? Mm. And then I have, I've had to build on it. I mean, it, you know, you, you really have to work it if you're going to make it a professional life for yourself. So mm. uh, building on my own natural heritage, I'll say, I went abroad to China, no, not to China then, to Hong Kong and Taiwan, and I did lessons and I broad broadened my Cantonese cooking into Sichuan cooking and Shanghai cooking and now Vietnamese cooking. I, I really love, moved into that. So I teach Vietnamese now as well as Chinese. And so I've had to widen my, <coughs> widen my culinary knowledge and, um, and lose some of, some of the sort of 
small ideas I had that Cantonese cooking was the only Chinese food there was around, you know. I've, mm. I've, I've had to move sideways a little bit and acknowledge that there's more to, to life than mum's cooking. What about you, Rosa? Now, you have an interesting story because you were professionally, you've only been a chef for how, how many About years? 12 About years. 12. So it's um, never too late to start, <laughs> ever. <laughs> and before that, you were a hairdresser. I was, yeah. yeah. Oh. So how, how did you decide to, to give up the, uh, the hair scissors? Oh, I always had a love of food. Um, I think from about the age of nine, I started cooking meals in, with, for my parents. When we migrated to Australia, as you know, many migrants, my parents had to work. So as a nine-year-old, I cooked the family meal. When I come home from, um, from school, my mother would guide me, you know, sort of before she left for work as to what I had to, had to do. And I loved it. And I also started to explore. I'd read magazines and I'd try to do sort of interesting, different types of food as well. But, um, and then I would cook with my grandmother. My mother is one of 11 children. So my grandmother, you know, in the early days when we first came out, would have, you know, 30 people sitting at a the dining room table, and that's a lot of food. All my grandmother ever did was actually cook. Um, and she was like, your mother, my grandmother never spoke English either because she didn't, didn't go out. So for me, um, it's, yeah, it was just a passion that was always within me and sort of almost sort of by accident. I mean, the slow food movement helped me to meet a lot of chefs and a lot of hospitality people and, um, you know, you get to cook. I mean, I, before I even became a chef, I was cooking with some amazing chefs. I knew the McConnell brothers before they were famous, you know. <laughs> um, just through the slow food movement, so you talk about food, you talk about, you know, what you grew up with and, um, and then just by accident I fell into it and... There you go. I <laughs> have two restaurants. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. I keep pinching myself. How big a part does nostalgia play in, in your appreciation of Sicilian food? A lot. Um, it's funny. Um, I was thinking about this last night. And I, my parents, we, we didn't live in the mountains where my grandparents were. My parents moved to a city. But we'd go home quite a lot. And... Years later, when I was 25, we went back to Sicily, and even though I'd forgotten about some of the foods, we're on a train, and I could see these women picking something on the side of the railway tracks. And I turned to my husband, I said, that's wild asparagus. And he said, how do you know? I said, I don't know. Mm. I just knew. And I remember going to my, um, my aunts that night, and I said, were they picking wild asparagus? She said, yes, and just sort of came back to me. And that flavour of that asparagus, which is amazing, has um, it's, it's been with me all the time. And I'm always trying to find that authentic taste in food. We seem to lose a lot of the authentic mm. taste with a lot of things. And so that's why I love gathering sort of food in the wild because it takes me back to my past and where things were quite pure and unadulterated and just... And, and those sort of memories just sort of come back to me when mm. you sort of go back and you see things. You, go, oh, you know, I remember that. So, yeah, I, th I think it has quite a lot. Do, do people, do the diners always get it? Do they always get what you're presenting to them? Because I mean, in, in my experience, <coughs> I think people are used to these homogenous looking vegetables and meats. And I think when you present things in a much more rustic style, which is very definitely your style, some yeah. people are like, well, that doesn't look how I oh, think there a are restaurant are, meal should look. Yeah, there are people who look at it and don't understand. I mean, mm. I know sometimes, you know, um, I think the Greeks may be the same. When we cook peas, we cook peas right down, don't we? And they get sweet and they get beautiful. Um, so I often cook peas quite soft because I think the sweetness comes out. And so people say to me, they taste great, but don't you think they're just a bit soft? And I said, well, if we keep them hard and just blanched, they're just going to taste. But it's, it's different. So... You know, but some people will, you know, do understand that some things have... I like to overcook my vegetables in a way where you braise them with a little bit of oil, a little bit of water. Um, you know, it's nice to have things... Cri I don't, I don't, crisp vegetables, to me, you may as well eat them raw. I like to slow cook them and I think it brings out a lot of flavours. And you add a lot of flavour, a bit of garlic, a bit of oil. So um, some people do, some people don't, but, yeah, yeah, it's the way I do it. I like the way you do it, Rosa. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think everyone these days is very interested in the idea of authenticity when it comes to food. Authenticity is a great buzzword <coughs> and I, oh, maybe it's a knee-jerk reaction against the artifice of molecular gastronomy and what everybody had to eat during the late 1990s and early 2000s. 
Um, now, the likes of David Chang and Roy Choi have rejected this, the, the, the notion of authenticity. They say it's little more than a straight jacket. Um, Anthony Bourdain also questions the value of authenticity as a food cultural term. Do you think it's helpful at all, George? Um, I mean, you know, <clears throat> the chef has become, you know, there's a certain modernisation of, you know, I mean, I hate that word molecular gastronomy. It's, it's, it's a horrible word. It gives me shivers. Um, even though at one point in my career, I, I was sort of plagued as a guy cooking that, um, unfortunately. But I sort of look at it like is, you know, so, you know, I actually watched that movie Burnt the other day. What an absolute joke that was. I was actually, I walked out. <laughs> thank God I only paid $6.50 for it. But, um, cinemas in, in Brisbane, $6.50 bargain. Um, the popcorn was more expensive. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm deviant. But I looked at, you know, f for me it's about, um, you know, I, I, I'm, I love it because I've been brought up in this really classic kitchen being home, being mum, who I never cooked with, yeah? I never got to stand in the kitchen with mum and cook. That just never happened. But obviously, and I think that's why I became a chef. I think I, I never wanted to become a chef because <coughs> chefing actually isn't a beautiful job, yeah? It's, but I love and obsess by eating food. So, well, that was the next step. I think it's about, I, I look at, if, if I'm gonna lose the authenticity through the flavor, through modern technique, if, because technique's driving it, well then that's a problem. And I've done that. I've been in a position where all I'm thinking about is technique because you just want to impress. And then that overrides authenticity, that overrides the flavour. Um, where now I look at food and go, no, no, I need to keep the soul. Um, and if it means I have to use modern technique, well, I will use it. You know, we're slow cooking. A, there's Bastouma, a classic sort of Turkish flavour that obviously has been influenced into Cyprus. And we cook a rib of beef at the moment for 72 hours at 52 degrees in a plastic bag. I know some chefs are like, oh, how do you cook in a plastic bag? But there is, it is so much better than it, the way it was classically done, but the flavour's not lost. So it's about, you know, being open-minded bit like you've yeah. been. Being open-minded in mm. cooking, you know, it's really important. Mm. Do you think authenticity is a commercial imperative as, as well these days? Um, is it important to be seen, to be treading that line between creativity and not betraying your cultural roots? I think it's got to start with, with the classic, don't you, George? It's yeah. got to start that way. I don't think any chef can move straight into creating his own things without having a strong groundwork there to know exactly what it is. In Chinese cooking, especially in Cantonese cooking, the heat control, for instance, is the, the major thing in successful China, Cantonese cooking. And if you don't understand that, all the, all the ingredients in the world is not going to make that dish what we would call um, palatable, it, it, like what we would call the wok hasn't breathed, you know? And so those classic things have to be learned. But I think it's wonderful, for me anyway, I think it's wonderful to see Aussie chefs cooking Asian now and calling it their own. I think that's terrific, you know, that they, the wok is sort of sitting there in the, you know, in everybody's kitchen. I, I think I introduced Aussies, Australians to the wok 50, what, 54 years ago? I'd hold the wok up and, and they'd say it's a funny looking frying pan. They, they'd never heard of the wok. And, um, and so now I think every fourth home has a wok. Mm. And chefs are using Asian ingredients like it's their own, you know, Sichuan peppercorn and lemongrass, and it's, it's all part mm. of part of, of global cooking. Mm. And I find it a compliment in a way that what was old to us is now new in a mm. way. And you have to, everybody's moving. And I think, it, I think the, the traffic has to be two ways. I think the Chinese chefs have to move as well. They're stuck also. <laughs> In, in tradition too much, very often the older ones are. And the younger ones are moving in and taking in the best of the West. And that's a good thing as well. So uh, I, I think, you know, it's um, an exchange of ideas and Australia in particular is very good at doing it because we're kind of like an open, we're yeah. open to it all, aren't we? We're, we're not bogged down by, by history or tradition as much as the other countries. Mm. Yeah. Well, I guess that, <clears throat> brings us to the, the big question of what is Australian food? I mean, how, how yeah. do you define that? I think it's utterly impossible to. Yeah, there is, yeah. I mean, it's, it's multicultural, really. 
um, you know, you have these people that, you know, will, will have a bit of the fusion food and all that. But we, we probably have, like if you, you've just travelled, if you travel, you go to Italy, it's Italian food wherever you go. You might find the odd Chinese or the odd mm. Japanese, but it's still Italian and it's the same in, in Greece and in other parts of the world. Mm. Um, and I guess maybe it's because maybe the Italians, speaking for the Italians, they don't embrace other cultures as much because they just want to eat what they always eat. Whereas here, I don't know, you know, we, we want to explore. I want mm. to explore other cultures. Um, you know, I just met someone yesterday from Persia and unfortunately she doesn't cook, but, you know, tell me what the great dishes are mm. of your, you know, of your, your nationality. Yeah. And she's like, oh, you know, she didn't really have much to tell me. But I love, you know, I get in a taxi and the first thing I ask them is, you know, what do you cook at home? Yeah, I, I did that I coming in. Yeah. I talked to the taxi driver. It's, it's he, was great. In, he was Pakistani and he wanted to know what I cooked. I wanted to know what he cooked. Exactly. Yeah. Well, people it's always, good. when I get in a taxi from, you know, going, <laughs> going home from work, you know, yeah. you're in a restaurant yeah. and we start talking. And that's Australia. Yeah, yeah it's great. Australia. Yeah. So you, you know. I, I believe, and I will say this with my hand on my heart, obviously I'm very lucky that I've travelled a lot. We in Australia do better yeah. Italian food than not Italy, but anywhere else bar Italy. You can't get better, you can't get better French food, Chinese food. Outside of China, there's probably some amazing Chinese I can't remember. Well, we but outside chefs, of China, yeah. we, we do that. We do everything so good. What is Australian? Well, look, it's, there's, there's a bit of an argument there at the moment as well. You know, I mean, you know, really, are we are we cooking with enough indigenous food? Mm. You know, uh, that's a question. You know, why why are we using certain ingredients? And it's great that chefs are now really mm. putting a question mark on that. You know, we sat down with our fishmongers today to talk about really what is truly sustainable fish. <laughs> and native fish to Australia. And, mate, we bamboozled them. I walked out bamboozled, you know. So I'm, all, I'm, all I go is I'm so lucky to be brought up in this country where it's given... I mean, we were, we're, we're, we were doing a tasting of seven different Japanese vinegars in a mm. restaurant that's Greek. I mean, <laughs> whoa. But we will incorporate that in the food because it is delicious shisho vinegar. I was like on the floor going, oh, my gosh, how amazing is that? Yeah. We're lucky. We are. Do any oh, of we you, are very lucky. Do any of you use kangaroo or even wallaby in your cooking? I don't. Yeah. A couple of Chinese restaurants have done that and... Uh, mm. I did it with a Hong Kong chef who came over and stayed at my house and he was dying to, to get to cook kangaroo. It's just a long, slow cooking process like my mother used to specialise in, um, say, brisket and turnips, you know, and it was a sort of the same, same master sauce and so I gave him the recipe for my mother's brisket and we did kangaroo instead. Mm. It was good. I massacre it every time. <laughs> it's just oh, yeah. dreadful. From my point of view, wallaby, fantastic because there's some incredible good practices, especially farming practices. With kangaroo, we've got a big issue with that in Australia and it needs to be resolved. It needs, yeah. Yeah. you know, you can't just shoot the animal, stick it on the back of a ute, drive it around for three hours and then finally it gets to us. No. It's ungraded. It's not correctly, you know, put to sleep. So there's a bit of a chat about that at the moment and it needs to be fixed. Mm. Yeah. But that's not what's being sold, though. I think what's being sold, what kangaroo meat that's being sold has to be certified, like it can't. Yeah. At that time, we got really? it from South Australia. Really? Yeah. <laughs> next question. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next question is for you, George. Um, as a second generation Greek Australian, do you think it's a different process to, to our, our two ladies here? Because a first generation immigrant side, you know, it's more keeping in touch with the old mm. country. As a second generation, is there sort of an, a stage of teenage rebellion you have mm. to go through before mm. you return to the mother cuisine? Yeah. Is yeah, that you, how you there's experience a it? There's a story in my book, you know. I grew up, you know, going to school with the Tupperware container, you know, where, and I just wanted, my mates, there was a good six of us, we're all very still close, and, you know, we just wanted that, that, that cool lunchbox with the dividers with that square sandwich fitted in perfectly. <laughs> like, we wanted that. We wanted to be that. We wanted those fluffy white sandwiches, you know, the crust cut off, and we didn't get that. We got this lunchbox that stunk, you yeah? know? Stunk in a good way, you yeah? know? Um, and then one day... We, we wanted, and the story's in my book, it's, uh, we, my brother and I wanted chicken nuggets, so we convinced mum. Um, and she goes, yep, done, I'll cook you chicken nuggets. Mm -hmm. we, she made us chicken nuggets, absolutely delicious, chips fried in olive oil, yum, yum, yum. 
you know, delicious. Yeah, and months later, my brother, who's eight years older than me, obviously a little bit more clued up than I was back then, his mate, mum has stitched us up. What are you talking about? They weren't chicken nuggets. I go, well, where were they? They were crispy lamb brains. <laughs> And, you know, all I wanted to be was the Aussie kid. But now I've realised in, my, in my, my life now that I am the Aussie kid. And, you know, I'm very grateful that I got given this life of where food was the, the centre. And it wasn't, we weren't, a, you know, South East and, we, you know, Mulgrave boys growing up. Food was the, the, whatever mum and dad could afford, it went into that food. You know, and it was absolutely now I look at it and go, how good was that? Where before I hated it, I didn't want to do it. Even when I started my apprenticeship, I was in a French kitchens, you know, we left when I worked in London in, you know, a you know, classic two star French restaurant. And then suddenly the penny dropped one day and went, hang on, I know this flavour. I know the flavour of what, you know, uh, you know, traditional stifado is or choriatic is, but how can I do that and make it what it should be? now and and australia is the best place to do that have you met any resistance from the old guard who don't appreciate your messing with the, the mm, true flavors my of mother <laughs> <laughs> really? no you know look i remember when we first opened the press club the, i mean the greeks was you cannot make look well, there's classic greek donuts you cannot put a scallop inside them and serve them as a savory dish and my question is but why and I'm always, a, I've always put a question mark, but why can't we do this? Why can't we do that? So that, that, was, that was interesting. And yeah, look, you know, there was a lot of, and I'm in mean, a city with a lot of Greeks. And I would say 20% of our customer base across the group are Greeks. The rest have sort of, no, they don't want to buy it. And that's okay, you know, that's, that's cool. They're traditionalists. Yeah. You know, um, when I was at early days at Kitchen, um, I used to have one particular Italian gentleman, I hope he's not here, um, and he'd come in and he loved my food and he'd always sit, always on his own, oh, Rosa, this is great, and he'd eat it, but you know what, next time you need to add a bit of, oh, yeah. okay, yeah. next time he'd come back, Rosa, this is great, but you know what, I think next time you should add this. So this went on for ages and one day he went, Rosa, I know, it's great and I should add a bit of something, but you know, that's the way I do it. He was Italian and he, he wanted... A lot of people want to eat the food that their mother cooked, even when they go out, even though, you know, yeah. they're quite traditional and they don't like change. And, you know, I cooked the way my mother cooked or, you know, I have my interpretation. But a lot of people, you know, if you have a little bit of a slight di sort of different sort of thing in that, it's like, well, that's not how we cook it, you know. So I get that a lot. Yeah, people tell me how to... what to put in my dishes. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> what about you? Have you ever come across anything that makes you shudder when you see what some pe somebody's interpretation of Cantonese cuisine? Oh, I do cuisine. all the time, yes. What do you do? Are you very polite? <laughs> it, it, it's a worry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but just in conversation more than anything else. Oh, they say, Elizabeth, oh, just, I've, I've, we've been stir-frying for years. Every, every Friday my, my husband does this and every Tuesday I do that and we eat Chinese twice a week, you know. And I ask them what they eat and when they tell me, I think, oh, goodness <laughs> me. <laughs> I don't know what to say, you know. Uh, but then I think, well, they're happy with it. They're, they're very happy with it. And, uh, but then, um, yeah, I, I'm a bit of a purist when it comes to, to what I've learned from my mother's knee, I think. And I don't change her recipes very much. And because I never had a, an Australian or a Western meal until I was about 12. I just ate Chinese all the time. And that was funny because I think food's the only thing that ever separated me from my school friends, you know, because socially, uh, sports or music or anything, I was just the same as any Aussie girl at school. But when I came home, I, was, I had to be really Chinese and my mother and the mm. ama would be there and the food was very much exactly as my mother cooked it. And I lived like that until I think one day my girlfriend asked me home for her place for the weekend. And um, my dad was very forward thinking and he, he, he welcomed that. He wanted us to be um, a part of the Australian social scene. He didn't keep us away from that. He said, go, you go and enjoy yourself. And so I did. And I remember her Sunday lunch. And I, you've got to remember, I hadn't, eaten, I hadn't seen Western food at this stage in a home. And I, was, I think I was about 11 or 12. And Mrs. Reed was a Sunday lunch and I, I, I was gobsmacked when I saw the, the, the table. It was so beautiful. 
ours had nothing on it except chopsticks and, and bowl, you know, and then the food was the decoration. But she had flowers, it was a lace tablecloth, and I remember she had sweet things on the table at the same time. It was Sunday lunch, you know, big deal in those days. And she cooked a rabbit casserole. She was in the was country girl. And um, the casserole came out with the veggies in another casserole. There were scones and jam and cream, I remember, and biscuits on the table or cake on the table. And being a dutiful, brought up as a dutiful Chinese daughter, that you don't overeat one thing, you eat a little bit of everything in the Chinese <laughs> way. I, I ladled out some rabbit on my plate. <laughs> I put some carrot on the, on the plate as well that she had. And then I took the jam and the cream and the scone. <laughs> And I put it on the plate. Oh, I thought it was oh, quite good, actually. Oh. <laughs> and so I, we kids sort of educated my mother, you know, a little bit into different ways. And about every two months or so, she would say, we're going to go English today, and she'd do a roast lamb. Uh, and um, Dad did the potatoes. Mum always cooked a big pot of rice. She said, you can't go to bed unless you've got some rice <laughs> in your stomach. And she'd stir fry the beans, of course. And then the gravy was, was Chinese, you know. It was, <laughs> but that was an English meal. So uh, and then gradually, you know, I, I sort of uh, learnt that you can enjoy different cuisines and so forth. And uh, so now I experiment as much as I can. I'm, I'm not terribly good at it, I think, mixing up my, my cuisines. Not as good as George. <laughs> so I, I'm still fairly fairly much my mother's daughter when it comes to cooking Chinese, but I will, I will do Greek salads, I will do Italian pasta, I love it, and uh, I, I think I'm pretty much, uh, you know, able to mix and match a little bit more now. My children are next generation, that's different again, isn't it? They cook a lot more Western than I do. Very modern sensibility. Yeah. Now, I'm going to raise the dread, dreaded F word, fusion. <laughs> Where does evolution end and fusion mm. begin? And why do we hate fusion so much? Do you hate it, Or is George? that just me? Sorry. Do you hate fusion? Um, I, I don't hate it. I'll, I'll no, eat I it. I don't know how to do fusion. I don't do fusion. No. Um, but um, oh, I'm, I'm happy to, to explore other sort of foods. Would you and use Chinese black beans in your cooking? No, I don't. No. Mm -hmm. You would? Yeah. Yeah, you would. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, if it makes sense. And, yes, it's got to make and it sense. And it tastes yummy. Yes, I mean, at the does. end of the day, it's got to be yummy. Yeah. And it's got to be, you know, nostalgia's got to obviously play. For me, in a lot of my cooking, it's got to be yeah. nostalgically driven but yeah. or produce driven of the month or whatever that case may be. But I was sitting at Laos Family Kitchen on Sunday yes. with my kids and yeah. we're having lunch there and had the most amazing um, tofu dish with um, sort of like caramelised pork. Right. Sort of sticky pork all over it, um, sort of minced up. It was absolutely delicious. And did you get and ideas sweating from that? Sweating like a <laughs> I'm loving it. And yeah, I, you, you know, ideas. obviously I got ideas yeah. for that. And yes. that's, you know, suddenly a note went into my, you know, into my phone. And, you know, that, that there's something about that that I'm going to. Was it the caramel out. pork? Caramelized pork? No, or it was the, the tofu, tofu. The texture of the tofu. The texture of the and tofu. I love that idea how. You know, every Greek will go, you, we don't eat tofu, yeah. but that's okay <laughs> because I want to be able to, as long as it tastes good, yeah. you know, and, and it looked like feta cubes to me, so suddenly yeah, there's... Yeah, I'm, I'm saying, but I, I, that's what I think, you know. So I love feta cheese too. There you go. We should do a swap. <laughs> <laughs> but my, I guess, my feta for your tofu. Yeah. <laughs> but I guess people come to your restaurant and expect that. I think people would come to my restaurant and wouldn't expect it. No, I think it's how you know, how you put food on the table and, you know, people know mm. me as a home cook and a traditional. So I think if I did something like that, people don't come, whereas I would come to you to have that sort of, you know... And that is yeah. a skill. Yeah, that, is a, that is a very difficult skill to keep that, you know... I, I mean, I can't do it with Greek food. I cannot do it. And, you know, it's, it's my struggle where, you know, um, my, my in-laws are Italian and their cooking is just... My, my mother-in-law's cooking is just so beautifully clean and it doesn't... It's the same all the time. Yeah. And it's, it is. It's been given... I mean, I struggle sometimes with new chefs when they go, oh, you know, don't you think you should add a bit of that or a bit of this to it? And it's like, well, no. It's, it's about the simplicity. It's my kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I do struggle with chefs wanting but to put things in. It's also... I mean, it's nice. I mean, we, I was doing this demo once and um, we, we had a, a shoulder, a lamb, and... Uh, lady puts her hand up she goes I cut my shoulder into two and put I go oh, okay 
okay, that's okay, why is that? And she looked at her mother and went, Mum, you taught me to do that. <laughs> yeah. And she went, yeah, actually, you know what, I don't know. She looked at the grandmother and went to the grandma, why do we cut it in half? She goes, because darling, back then our ovens were that big. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> And it's funny that sort of, mm-hmm. isn't it? Yeah. How, how, I mean, it's wonderful. Yeah, <laughs> it's great. <laughs> it's cute. <laughs> now our ovens are this big. We now they're that big. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We'll have to start eating horse more. Uh, there was an interesting issue with yeah. David Thompson. That horse is a whole, that's another wheel I sent oh, to yeah. talk. Okay, mm. book it in. Uh, there was an interesting issue with David Thompson. Um, the Aussie chef who specialises in Thai food at his um, world-renowned restaurant Nam. So in 2010 or thereabouts, he declared to a reporter, perhaps inadvisedly, he was on a mission to revive Thai cooking. Um, the nation of Thailand did not take to this information very well. <laughs> um, here's a quote from a, a Thai food writer. When someone comes along and presents himself as the spokesman of Thai cuisine, it's like Osama bin Laden going to the Vatican and saying he's the high authority on Catholicism. Um, now, David Thompson speaks and reads Thai. He cooks and lives in Thailand, and he's devoted his life to Thai food. Who was right and who was wrong? <laughs> <laughs> Any of you? Oh, gee. Perhaps he shouldn't put himself out as the spokesman, do you think? He could do it as best as in his way, but I don't think he should be a spokesman for Thai cuisine. Do you? Should be a Thai person? No, uh, do you have to be? I mean, I'm not to really a, Greek. To be a spokesman, <laughs> to represent, you're not Greek? No, well, not re- I'm an Aussie boy. I mean, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm, and I find that really, some, I get people come, oh, you're the Greek chef. Like, Aussies will come, you're the Greek chef. I'm like, what? I'm Aussie. And yeah, okay, my background's <laughs> Greek. But I think that's a, I think there needs to be a little bit of humility there within think, David Thompson to go, sh- you know yeah, what? Yeah. I'm really proud that I cook incredible Thai food. And I think mine's up there with the best. That's being proud yeah. and, yeah. you know what, yeah, good on you. But, but would you put yourself out as a spokesman for Thai food, even though you're proud of what you do? Mm. Well, he's lived there for years, so, but I don't know. I don't know. What do you think, Rosa? I, I don't know. I've never eaten his food, but um, I guess... You know, they should be proud that he's embraced their culture and he's embraced their food. And he obviously does a great job. So I think they should be proud that someone other than a Thai person is actually mm-hmm. promoting their food, promoting, promoting their country. Good, yeah. um, more so maybe that someone in their own country. I mean, is there an, another famous Thai chef that could be that spokesperson? We don't hear about them. So maybe he's sort of, you know, I think... Yeah, he's promoting Thailand, he's promoting the food and probably getting more people to eat Thai food than, than anyone else. Andrew McConnell was the chef who, he, he said in an interview a few years ago that he held off opening an Asian-styled restaurant for many years, despite having worked extensively in Hong Kong and Shanghai because he didn't want to be the white guy who was appropriating Asian food. Um, is, is that an issue, a political issue in food of appropriation? Or Elizabeth, no, no, I think especially promoting it is good. I think that's mm. good. Like for instance, we we have Neil Perry, um, openly loving Chinese food, and he was influenced as a little boy with it, and he he does it well. But uh, he's not Chinese. I think he knows. I think he knows that enough. But I don't think he would put himself out as a spokesperson mm. for Chinese cuisine. And, but but um, he's very good at it, and the same with Jeff Lindsay at Vietnamese cooking. Mm. But I don't know that um, they can write about it, I think, yeah, and teach it if they want to, but mm. do you think that should represent it? Don't know. <coughs> oh, you know. It's hard, isn't it? I just, you, know? you know, I mean, I, 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 a couple of my chefs, a guy, Travis, who's been with me since day one at Helena, he knows more about Greek food than a lot of Greeks do. And I openly tell oh, okay. I openly tell Greeks that because it, 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 it I, like I get not upset or angry that you know they'll go you know the tarama should be pink and it's like no it shouldn't mm-hmm. you should do your research and actually understand. Do you know there was a film ages ago with Sydney Pointier in it and he said you can learn the Watusi but we are the Watusi. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I think that sums it up. Yeah. That's Done. what he said. I remember that. I, I, I must have taken it in because, I, I don't know, it must have 
resonated somewhere deep in me because I always remember him saying that. You can learn it, but you are not it. Mm. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, I... Can I speak about myself for a minute? Because you guys have been hogging the limelight. We're waiting for that. Um, <laughs> I am the product of very Anglo-centric 1970s upbringing and diet where pineapple curry chicken was about as exotic <laughs> as it got. Um, I, as a result, I love food, real food, and I love watching TV chefs like Yotama Otolenghi and Rick Stein. Do you think that food TV is such a big thing these days because for so many people it appropriates a sense of belonging, it creates mm. that? by default. Look, we've got to also remember there's a socio-demographic of people that will never get to eat at Nopi or, you know, or, or at Rick's places. So for them, that is like, you know, it's like gold for them, yeah? And I think it's brilliant. I mean, you know, Otterling is incredible and amazing and, you know, wonderful and it sort of excites you and excites people. And if it can drive, you know, people, then, you know, we, we had this massive debate, you know, um, about Parmesan, you know, they're going, oh, we're talking of MasterChef, you know, we can't have Australian Parmesan, we've got to have, you know, Italian Parmesan. And I, and I get that, but if I can take that, you know, that demographic of people from to stop buying that shaky Parmesan from the aisle, <laughs> right, that was probably never seen an animal Cardboard. in its life, mm. and use that wedge of Australian Parmesan, we're on the right track. And that's through, obviously, TV. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 My, my son had an English girlfriend he met. My son actually worked at Otolenghi. Um, and while he was over there, he met this English girl and she came out and he said, because um, yeah, I love to cook, you know, and I said, well, he said, oh, she doesn't eat very many things at all. And anyway, we worked out she ate uh, uh, processed cheese, apple and broccoli and pasta. That's all she ate. So I made pasta with broccoli. And I said, um, forget what her name was. I said, have some cheese. Oh, <laughs> 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 she said, oh. <laughs> um, she said, I don't eat cheese. And I said, what do you mean you don't eat cheese? You could have parmesan. She said, oh, no. I said, have you had parmesan before? She said, oh, yeah, my mum buys yeah. the green. And I said, okay. I said, try this. Well, she got hooked on parmesan. She'd never had real parmesan before. Mm. So yeah. it's about having good the produce and the real thing. And you see, often, I see that quite a lot. And I hate when young people or children say, I don't like that. Mm. I said, you tell me you don't like it after you eat it. You try it first. If you don't like it, that's fine. But often, they don't eat the right thing. So parmesan, I think, is a terrific example where it's not real food. Mm. You know, that, that's not real food at all. So, you know, to have so they're not together thing. anymore, yeah? <laughs> no, no, no. He was a chef. <laughs> he was a chef. She didn't eat food. <laughs> She's lovely. She's lovely. <laughs> she only ate four things. <laughs> she did actually venture out and have a little bit more after that. When, but, yeah, it was, it was difficult. <laughs> so any, any one of you guys, where do you see food going in the, in the near future? Our embrace of food, I, I'd vote one for regionality. I think people are getting really excited about regionality and so yeah. not just Chinese food, but yeah, Sichuan. Yeah. What do you think, Elizabeth? I think it's going well and it's going to keep going and it's going to embrace so many, so many different cuisines and culinary ideas are all going to meld together and maybe I hope that won't make Australian food sort of, you know, um, confusing. You know, but, but I think I think there's enough people like Rosa <laughs> and the uh, Laos Family Kitchen. Mm. I mean, you got an idea from, from the tofu, but mm. none of the dishes there had any Greek overtones, did it? No, no. <laughs> it'll be very, very Chinese always. Mm. So there's enough purists, I think, mm. in every you know every cuisine to keep on keeping on that way. But I think good for all the the innovative young chefs who are. Really moving, moving into every every other area that they can, so long as they do it well and respect good food. I think Australia is in a good place. Hmm. I what think you, so. What do you think, Rosa? Um, <clears throat> pardon me. Um, I I think we're going to sort of branch out and see other cultures, other foods from other countries we don't know much about. Yeah. But what I would like to see is more people know where their food comes from. So when they do go out 
that they don't shop in a supermarket and just buy tomatoes for the sake of buying tomatoes, but that they might go to the farmer's market and only buy seasonal food and know where that seasonal food comes from. And just to sit and eat that simple tomato rather than just eat tomato for the sake of eating tomato. So wait for a whole year to eat this wonderful tomato mm -hmm. That you've got from a farmer's market, that's organically grown. I think people are going to become more obsessed about where their food comes from and hopefully shop locally in farmer's markets and grow their own, which is even better. Mm. That's what I'd like mm. to see. Mm. And George? Yeah, it's definitely an exciting time. You know, I, I, my, my late grandmother, we, we would sit around um, the kitchen table and, and back then I was, was like, oh, do I have to do this? But, uh, you know, she'd tell me the story of when she arrived here in in you know uh, late 60s her mortar and pestle getting confiscated at, at customs because they thought it was a, a weapon um, <laughs> i mean and look where we've come i mean we that that i just spent a, a week in in london um doing a couple of stages and meeting some incredible chefs and they're they're so envious of us they want to try all of our restaurants there, you know, so gone are the days where we were looking out going, well, oh, we've got to go there. We still do, do that because there's incredible restaurants around the world. But now everyone's looking at us going, oh, we want to come here. We want to try that. We've heard about this. So it's sort of credit to, you know, the, 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 um, the well, you guys that are writing about it and telling the world, all of, I guess, all the chefs and the growers the television. that are doing it, television, mm. I think it's all those mediums that have really gone. I mean, Mars, and I'll, you know, obviously I'm proud of it, it's in 188 countries around the world, MasterChef Australia. So obviously that's influencing, you know, a lot. So, and that's really cool because it's also showcasing a lot of local chefs in Australia. And that's really, a, a, that's a positive, I see. And I still have students coming to learn my old-fashioned Chinese cooking. And that's 54 years later. Oh, wow. Yeah, and they're still booking into my school. So I think that there is still, you know, <coughs> there's going to be, I think, um, just a widening of culinary palate, of palates, you know, mm. and we've, we're just going to be able to embrace everything that we want to. And we just, as I say, we're lucky. We've got so much at our fingertips here. So I, I can take Australian ingredients and turn them into Chinese. <laughs> easily, you know, like... Carly like, does that every day. Yeah, that's Seriously. right. Yeah, that's yeah. it. That's yeah, it. But is... I suppose the Chinese cuisine differs a little bit more from Greek or Italian or Lebanese uh, because of the style of eating, that, that old traditional way of meeting around the, the table, the round table, you know, and, and the food in the centre is to be shared. Um, I know that the shared plates in Italian cooking and Greek cooking is sharing, but yeah. you still put it on your individual plate and go away and eat by yourself, don't you? Sort of, it's still on your at plate. The table. Yeah. Still at the table, but on your own plate. On yeah, your own okay, plate, yeah, yeah. whereas the Chinese way of eating, that's, I used to cringe with that when I was a little girl, that my girlfriends would come home, you know, and they'd see us eating in that way, and they'd be wide-eyed. They'd never seen anything like it. Everybody with their chopsticks going into the same plate and eating it, you know, from that. So our way of eating makes us a little bit more different, I think. Mm. Whether that, I think that will stay because it's something very close to Chinese hearts, you know, to share that food mm. Absolutely. as a family, yeah. I think that's mm. a nice note to end it on because mm -hmm. we indeed have to end it. So thank you all thank very you. much. And now we're going to throw it open to questions. <laughs> Hi, um, so my yaya when we were growing up um, had this sense that uh, our family should assimilate with Australian families. So um, she would cook these lavish, beautiful, traditional Greek meals with a side of craft plastic cheese. Um, <laughs> and so to this day, I just have this like, God, I go bananas for that plastic cheese. And so to all our panellists, I wonder, are there any weird guilty pleasures you know, weird processed foods that you love, and what are they? Ham and pineapple pizza. I love a ham and pineapple pizza. <laughs> so did my late father. He had to have pineapple on his pizza. Oh, um, yeah. I'm trying to think. Tomato sauce? Yeah? Yeah? And, uh, uh, you know, a good pie, and I love my tomato sauce. So I guess um, when I have um, what you call schnitzel, we call cotoletta, I like a bit of tomato sauce on that, but... That's Yum. about it. Yeah, especially in a sandwich. Yeah. Yeah. I like pies. I like pasties. 
I like fish and chips. I like violet crumbles. <laughs> George. There you go. Yeah, it's funny. I was, it, as, I was in London and my mate Sat Baines took me to his mum's house for curry. Uh, incredible. Put this incredible spread on. And then there was a big bowl of salt and vinegar chips in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> I was like random. He, she goes, you know, in this sort of, you know, weird Indian English accent. Yeah, it's like when we came here, we just wanted to, you know, add a bit of Anglo to our cooking. Yeah. It's like, all right. And actually, the salt and vinegar chips and curry were delicious. <laughs> well, you go to Italy now and you have those little takeaway pizza places, especially in Rome, and they'll have the big um, trays of pizza and they'll have po- potato chips on the pizzas. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah. Oh, it's it's not nice. I'm oh. starving. Potato <laughs> chips on the pizza. <laughs> <laughs> and what about the Victoria sponge? Isn't it beautiful? Mm. You know, a lovely fluffy sponge with passion fruit icing. <laughs> oh, it's gorgeous. Yeah, I don't mind a sponge. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Quick question. Uh, George, sorry. What possessed Hellenic P- Republic to deconstruct your moussaka? Moussaka? Yeah. Hellenic Republic or yeah. the press club? Uh, no, Hellenic Republic. Okay. Oh, we've deconstructed a lot of things. I mean, <laughs> we did a uh, when tomatoes are in season, which is very shortly. We did a Greek. We do Greek salad where we break it down into like forty-five different ideas on one plate. Um, you know, as I said, it's 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 about putting a question mark next to why. Why can't we? Mm-hmm. As long as it tastes good, um, and why can't I? You know. A, Put, get que- people to think about it as they're eating it. What, I mean, why did he do it? Um, you know, I mean, what, what, what happened when they put basil on tomato? I mean, whoever did that, you know, I mean, they were, back then they probably would have thought, well, this is weird, what are you doing? But that's, I guess, the evolution of food. And don't get me wrong, there's some classics and delicious things that go together. I mean, moussaka, for example, was in Mumbaldine, came from uh, Istanbul, was a baked egg plant with tomato sauce. Or oh, the Sicilian parmigiana, it was called. Yeah. <laughs> now we're going to get into a debate. <laughs> we'll send a look out. And then, obviously, a guy called Selemente, as a chef, went to work for Escoffier, learned how to make bechamel, yeah, went to Greece, added mints and bechamel on top, made moussaka. Yeah? So, I mean, you know, that's how wonderful is that? Mm. Like, yeah. And then, but obviously, us Greeks think, well, that's a, a dish. No, well, actually... Um, so it's, for me, it's about looking at things and putting question marks next to anything. Slightly wacky. Sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes it does. Like sweet and sour sauce and bechamel sauce together. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I do like that fluoro yellow chicken. What is it? Lemon chicken? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, you like that? Love that. Yeah. How do you make that Greek? Add feta. Add feta. <laughs> 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 Next question. Actually, Sicilians do a um, sweet and sour dish. Yes. Quite oh, a few. Quite a, quite a lot. Yeah. I think sweet and sour. Agrodolce. Agrodolce. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Quite a lot. Yeah. 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 Each of you, which, um, when you're tired and hungry and you've just got home, what your quick throw together dinner is? Mm-mm. When you're tired and hungry. And I'm tired and hungry and I've worked a double and I'm very tired to go home and have a cup of tea and two pieces of toast, one with a bit of cheese, whatever's in the fridge, and the other one with a bit of honey. Mm. I love it. Good bread though, most important. That's what I like, cup of tea and two pieces of toast. Me, oh, tired and hungry. It could be what Rose has had, something like that, but if I've got some leftover rice in the refrigerator, which I <laughs> usually have, I might just heat that up quickly, steam it up again, although the microwave's not bad for that. And we have a Chinese um, sort of bacon. It's called lap yolk, mm. and it's thick, thick rashes of belly pork. Not thin, it's fairly old. It's about a half, a, oh, three quarters of an inch thick. And you can steam that on top of the rice that I'm steaming up again, and it gives them, as it's smoked. It's smoked and dried, and I don't know, the flavours in it are just unbelievable you know and that goes through the rice and you just eat that up with a bowl of rice or one fried egg on a bowl of rice yeah. and put some oyster sauce in the middle <laughs> <laughs> of the yolk yeah Yum. Uh, my kids and i we we got this a crusket um vegemite 
avocado, tomato, and grated parmesan. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Crushed uh, it. We just love it. Mm. It's a snack. It's easy. Yeah. What about you, Larissa? Me? <laughs> um, I, seven minutes, spaghetti with um, garlic, anchovies, and parsley. Yeah. Wow. All you know, all seven young. minutes. Yep. Seven. So if I've had too much to drink, I have to be really careful in the garlic. <laughs> <laughs> Sli- I've sliced my fingernails off before. So. Any questions? Um, thank you very much for uh, to the panel. Um, totally agree with you about the uh, growing connection between um, love of food, both in the home and in restaurants, and the growing um, demand for farmers markets. But there still seems to me to be a disconnect. If you're not in horticulture within the vicinity of a city to which a farmer can go to a farmer's market, there still seems to be a bit more of a political disconnect with farmers on the land. Can you see a time where we revert to being, where that um, bush city divide is a bit more broken down than it is now? I'll leave that one to you. Oh, thanks. (laughs) Can I tell you, can I just very quickly, can I tell you that there was a farmer's market in the city today? Anybody know that? Yeah. Yep, just down the corner of William Street and Burke Street, amazing farmer's market. Yeah. So, yep. yeah, every second Thursday. C- call me, I mean, there's, there's, uh, there's a lot of political stuff that we could delve into and it's, it will take hours and we'll be starving. But <laughs> I think there's a lot of things we need to, in terms of what we can fix up, is just, you know what it is, it's sometimes let's just go back to the, the way we used to do it. So I walk into the supermarket, I rarely do it. I'm, I'm there wandering around. And I look at the dairy case and I'm looking there at the milk. I don't know what to buy. What do I buy? Natalie goes, Skip, make sure you buy milk. What do I buy? Proactive, active, low fat, skinny milk, this milk, that milk, blah. Just give me full cream milk the way it was that it's meant to be. Yeah. And we'll all live happily ever after. So potentially it's maybe let's just clean and go back to the way it is. My in laws, they're all self sufficient at home chickens, eggs, and we're lucky because they're a bit old school. Honey, vegetables, prosciutto, wine, the whole lot. Like if we, the front gate's locked, we could live for weeks, yeah? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's the will to want. It's the will to, um, like, that's part of life. And, you know, unfortunately for some people, it's not. So that doesn't drive that commercial We get lazy. Really. We just yeah, want to go do. and just pick up something and go rather than think about you know, prepare in advance, you know, I'll go and shop at this farm. There's enough shop, shops around, or, you, you know, you're local, that you can just buy just good produce. No, they make furniture, pol- they make um, l- lemon cordial with artificial lemons and furniture polish with lemons. Yeah. I mean, give me a break. Yeah. Like, let's, mm. so, but we are, the thing is, at least we're talking about it, things are moving. This big supermarket change, uh, chains, they are, they are changing, yeah. they have to or else there's going to be a big problem because we're getting wiser and smarter. Yeah, yeah, we are. Um, just on that same kind of theme, I was just going to ask, Rosie, you were saying before that it is important to know where your food comes from and um, often a barrier to that can be, you know, price or convenience, as you were saying. What, what, so what sort of foods do you think you should make no compromises and always know where it's coming from and to what other oh. foods do you think just buy from the supermarket? Or? Definitely vegetables and meat. Um, it's more f- about, like if you do shop well and shop seasonally, it's the taste. It just tastes better. And um, I think, you know, vegetables are the most important thing. I actually, I don't shop in supermarkets if I can help it, but I sometimes go in and artichokes is one of my favourite vegetables. And I can't tell you how many times I go into a supermarket and the artichokes are sitting on that bench and they'd have to be about four weeks old. Mm. And they say, we are fresh. They're not fresh. You go to the farmer's market on a Saturday morning or whenever and they've just been picked. You know, we, we just went to a farmer's market this afternoon and the gentleman there, you know, I've just picked that lettuce, I've just picked that radish. That artichoke on that supermarket shelf um, has been sitting there for so long and then people go home and they think, this is an artichoke. So... You, yeah, we, we have to demand a freshness, and as you say, I think they are changing. But um, yeah, just that you know that 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 person has grown that tomato, has you know, has bred that pork for you, you know, to, whether they make prosciutto, or they make sausages. Um, like I've just recently spent a weekend at um, Bandara Pork, where this wonderful woman is raising the pigs. They're in the, you know, and she actually 
goes from start to finish with them. She cures them. She, she actually has them butchered elsewhere, but she cuts them all up and she sees them from start to finish and then she brings them to the farmer's market. And, and you know, there's a bit of love in that. And I think sometimes, you know, um, we, we as consumers, just it's just as easy to pick something up, take it home and eat it. But I think we need to know that it's about the taste of, of the... For me, it's about the taste. Mm. You know, I can't, yeah. I can't eat a tomato out of season because I find them quite... But to eat a tomato that, you know, someone has grown out, in the, out under the sun and then, you know, brings it to you and the smell alone is enough to make you buy them. So uh, I think we get lazy and I think we should make an effort to go out and source our food from smaller growers and, you know, sort of little stores, you know, your butcher. Your butcher, you know, knows you by name when you walk in. You know, you go to the supermarket and they say, what's this? They don't know what they're selling, whereas your butcher, you know, he says hello when you walk in or your fruit yeah. shop, you know, it's just nice. You know, it goes back to sort of how it used to be. So, um, yeah, I think it's important. We have time for one more question if anybody wants to stick up their hand. Anyone? There's one. Hi, guys. Um, just wondering what's your favourite cafe in, or restaurant in... Melbourne. Oh. Um, all of them. <laughs> all George, of them. you can't say your own. <laughs> no, that would yeah. be... No. Um, Favourite cafe? Um, I'm a... So, I, I, like, I don't know, I love going to Doc because it's, I love standing at... The, it's that feeling of standing at the bar having a coffee. It's sort of, you know, it's nostalgic again. It's, um, you know, and there's this nice bit of bread with prosciutto in it and it's delicious, but, yeah. I yeah. sort of go to the things that I'm used to and, yeah. It depends on your mood, it I think. It depends on the mood, yes. yeah. It depends on your mood for me. I mean, I try as many different places as I can. Um, you know, it depends on what you feel like. Like tonight my husband's going to meet me and we're going to head as far away as possible from any of the Oaks crowd and go off somewhere mm. and have maybe yeah. a pizza or something like. But you can have like. Japanese, you can have yeah. anything oh. now, yeah. you know, whatever you feel like it. But I wouldn't like to name... No, I don't. wouldn't like to give <laughs> any names out. <laughs> They're pleading the fifth. There's so many amazing yeah, places. So I mean, the, we, every corner of this city is... It's great. ...is yeah. filled. Then you, you start go, going into yeah. the burbs. I mean, jeebus yeah. me. You the suburbs are getting there, yeah. yeah. The suburbs, there's amazing restaurants coming into the yes. suburbs, which yeah. I think is great. Yeah. 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 Really good. So you don't have mm. to, you know, travel to... So support your local. <laughs> Well, um, thank you again, everybody, for coming along tonight. Um, we're going to take a few minutes break and then man the um, reading stall at the end of the room if anybody wants to stick around and have a chat or buy a book. Um, but I would like to give a big thanks to Rosa Mitchell, Elizabeth Trunk, and George Callan Barris. And Larissa, well done. <laughs>